This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make your next move with Squarespace. As many of you will know if you've watched this channel before that I was born in the UK, but I spent most of the first 30 years of my life growing up in Africa, in countries like Zimbabwe, Botswana, Lesotho, Eswatini, and South Africa. And I think when you live up that way, when you're kind of bouncing between different countries, especially as a child, you inevitably have some sort of identity crisis, asking yourself, who am I and where in the world do I really fit in? Photography for me has always been a very deliberate tool in helping me to explore the world that I'm living in. It helps me to go out and notice things and capture things and then look back at those images and work out who am I in all of this and why am I drawn to particular things in the society around them? What does that say about the society and what does it say about me and my place in it? When I first found Ian's work a few years back, it was when he was promoting his book Arcadia. And I remember being immediately struck by the quality of his work. And I don't just mean the technical side of it. I mean in those images' ability to convey a sense of mood and place and space. And for me, I was really drawn to them, my personality particularly, because there was a quiet to them and a kind of wistful melancholy. But after doing a bit of digging, I realized that Ian and I had similar stories in some ways. He was born in Peru and lived most of his childhood there, then spent some time in America, in Florida, in Miami, and then eventually moved back here to the UK because he has a link there with his father who's British. And he also said that he felt like an outsider and his camera became a tool to explore the country that he now lived in, to work out what it was, what the flavor of it was, what it had to say and who he was and his place in it. So I wanted to get Ian on this channel because I have a suspicion that there are a lot of photographers out there who use the camera as a way to explore the world they live in and their place in it, especially those of you who might feel like outsiders wherever you happen to live. And in this interview, Ian has some great advice for how to use the camera as a tool for exploration, but also how to build your own bodies of work that actually say and communicate something while you're going about that process. So I'm gonna shut up now and let you hear from my friend, Ian Howarth. So I was born in Peru to a Peruvian mother and an English father and um, yeah I lived there from obviously from birth until I was 12 years old. There was a lot of terrorism at the time in Peru um, and my dad had always had the idea to to move back to to Europe you know a, a, you know a, an area or a place um, that he hadn't been back to really to live for 30, 30 plus years but we ended up moving to to Miami um, instead. Um, he took a job with an international company and we were able to, to basically choose where we wanted to live and that included the US. And then after that we came to the to the UK. My dad semi-retired and I think he'd always had this plan that I would study in the UK. So we moved from Lima to Miami and then to sunny Yorkshire. What was interesting about um, England for me uh, at the time was that had, having been to the UK a few times, I was kind of quite aware of, of, of the differences um, between, between living in Peru and England. But then when you threw in Miami in the mix, it, 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 I think it just opened up my, my mind and my brain to, to just how different kind of the world was, you know. And I was interested in pretty much every aspect of, of that difference, not just the people and the way of life, but just even even just everyday things, you know, like everyday views and everyday sights, you know. I was, I remember like one of the questions I used to have is like, why are the blades of grass like thinner in England than they are in, in, in Miami? They're like f like four times thinner. Uh, and I, everything was just fascinating to me, you know, and obviously the smells and just the, the market town mentality of, of the UK where everything is very compact and very centered around, you know, the town center, whereas, you know, in the US and Peru and Lima, sorry, you have just swathes of space, you know, it's very hard to work out what the center is. The things that are around, the everyday things, the, these liminal spaces, if you want to call them, you know, they, they say a lot about people, you know, and, and, and obviously at the time when I was younger, I wasn't necessarily making these links, but now that I'm older, I'm able to kind of realize kind of the, the relationship between people 
and, uh, and the choices that they make with the things they leave behind in the man-made landscape. And, and I think that's the, very much the source of my fascination, I think. I've always felt like a little bit of an outsider. Even in Peru, I felt like an outsider because my name is Ian Howarth, which is probably the most English sounding name you can probably find, you know, and, and the name Ian, which for you, for anyone that's English watching, it, you know, it's not, it's not the most uh, contemporary name in, uh, in England. It's quite an old fashioned name, but in Peru is incredibly exotic, like incredibly exotic. So I had a bit of a rock star name, you know, they couldn't work out how this three letter name could be how it could be pronounced Ian you know they were just kind of quite amazed by it so having this name and maybe not looking traditionally Peruvian I think already kind of you know separated me and then you fast forward that to moving to England and it was weird like it was almost as if everything just washed away people just understood me as being like British I guess or English I guess but just an English person has moved away and hence the funny accent. So I was able to quite naturally, without really thinking about it, just kind of embed myself in a culture. And obviously these things now, to me, are not that important, but to someone who's like 15, 16, all you wanna do is fit in. I've begun to realize that actually, you know, there was kind of a bit of, a, a bit of an identity crisis there with me, you know, not really working out kind of who I am and, and the concept of where is home. You know, I, have no, I still don't know where home is. You know, I've, I, I still haven't really worked that out. So I, I, I kind of really began my, my, my foray into the visual arts kind of quite late. I think I was maybe 29 when I, when I started properly, 28. I was a cameraman and kind of budding DP. You know, I feel kind of slightly shame, uh, ashamed saying that because, you know, uh, any DPs watching will probably go, you're not a DP, mate, you know, so. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I wanted to do. You know, I, I, I did think Think that you know being a cinematographer was uh, was the best way to storytell. So it's almost like images with purpose, you know. And I and I really and I, st I still kind of believe that in many ways, you know. But I, I just found the process a bit too slow for me, you know. And I felt like because I was older, um, I felt like I had a lot of catching up to do, you know. And I felt like I'm not getting enough output here, you know. And and you know projects are you know just a bit slow in developing and whatnot. So. Just by sheer luck, a friend of mine was leaving the UK and he, he kind of gave me um, his Olympus OM-1 to be its next custodian. So I just loaded it up with film and, uh, and that was pretty much it. I, t I had a trip to Peru and I decided only to take a film camera, no digi, and took like 30 rolls of film with me. All the images are awful, but it began a process. And, and, and then I think the following year I went to Cuba and that's when I really began to solidify like I'm still happy with many of those shots, you know, um, just the way the frame and and the color and my choice of stock and and all of these things, it kind of just it kind of just clicked for me. I think photography it just gave me purpose, you know, it gave me like a sense of uh, of being able to understand and then having something tangible at the end of it. I guess you could say I'm nosy, but I, I just like to explore. I like to just see different things, like all the time, you know, and I get frustrated when I can't. I think I've always gravitated towards older things, you know, I think, I, I, you know, I've, it's not really about the aesthetics. For me, I just have questions. I, I always have questions about things, you know, I, I'm just interested in, in, in I, I, like, I, I'm s such a nosy person, like, I, I, I tend to ask a million questions about, I just want every detail, you know, I, I want to link everything up, you know, I don't want any stones unturned, and, and I think in terms of how I use my camera, I'm, I'm very much the same, you know, I want to find out why things are the way they are and I think that can be very easily bunched up as just go nostalgia and I don't think it's necessarily as simple as that for me you know I think there is an element of that I mean there's an element of the aesthetic you know I think I think some of the older things are just nicer you know I think for me they're just better built there's the textures are more interesting the colors are more interesting I mean England in the 70s was just mad like in terms of color and stuff like but just with absolute no color theory attached to anything. It was just like mustard and green and it's just weird, you know? And, and I think from an aesthetic point of view, purely from like what I like, I find that really interesting. You know, I love clashes and, and, and weird color, you know, I always have. So for me, the question is always like, how are these things still here? You know, what are the circumstances by which these things are surviving? And what are they saying about, about who we are? and where we're headed. And we're kind of gravitating towards this kind of, um, this modernity, you know, um, and much less of these remnants of the past are left behind. And, and I'm interested in that because um, there, there is a certain language 
a certain cultural capital to these things that, that, we, that, we, that, we, that we know, that we ignore, that are, they're just functional. But you know, when you put them together, they have a lot of, they have a lot of value and, and they say a lot about kind of who we are, or about the throwawayness of, of modern culture versus the longevity of, of older things, for example. But also there is, a, there, is the, there is a sadness in these things as well. You know, there is, um, you know, there is a, a, a sadness in this thing that we, I wouldn't say we humanize things, but we, we will humanize something that looks lonely. If you see a lonely phone box in the middle of a field and stuff, you know, and it's under pretty light, but it's kind of a bit battered, or maybe the, the phone receiver has been ripped out or something, there's a certain sadness to that, you know, and, and, I, and I kind of like that, you know, and it makes me feel something. I'm not sure if it's happiness because I'm getting a nice image or, or actually genuine sadness for this, for this relic of the past that is being forgotten about. And I think I've always been kind of fascinated by, by the idea of identity of place, you know, through the things that we see. You know, can you, can you explain to someone what this place is all about? You know, I'm casting my camera on something and I'm seeing it from my point of view, and then someone else might think, I recognize that, but I never would have thought of highlighting it kind of thing, you know? So I find that really interesting. And, and it's, almost like, it's almost like it's been a test for me to see if I can actually like cheat and go, it's like, I kind of want to go, have I got it right here, guys? You know, I'm, I'm not from here, but do you think I've, I've got it right? You know, it's, it's almost been like that, you know? And, and I don't know if that's born out of a sense of, of, of wanting to fit in. Consciously, I don't feel that anymore, but maybe subconsciously there is that, you know, maybe is this kind of like wanting to fit in. It's like, have I, in my 25 years in England, have I managed to, to cheat it? You know, do I know as much as you? Do you know what I mean? That kind of thing, you know? And, and I think there's a certain playfulness with that. I, I never try to, to sell the idea that a, that a photograph is somehow real life, you know? regardless of what people say about, you know, camera formats and stuff. It's like, oh, medium format is closer to reality. It's like, none of it's reality. You know, it's, it's, it's all edited. You know, whether I take a step back or a step, a step forward, I'm editing things by what I frame in and what I frame out. People have often said that there's a certain stillness uh, to my images. They're, they're, they're quiet images, you know, and, um, you know, I think I think now, after many years of shooting, I can kind of see it. And I think it's very much in my nature to try and seek places out that are, that are quieter, you know, that are, are away from the bustle. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a person that whenever I go away, I'm, I'm never doing very touristy things. I, you know, I, I, I do like weird things. You know, that's just my nature. You know, I like, slight, I, I like being weirded out, let's just say as well, you know. So I do like the more unusual things. So. When I began shooting for um, A Country Kind of Silence, I found that, you know, my progression as a photographer had hopefully improved. You know, I'd, 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 I just became better, I think more efficient uh, in, in how I was shooting and, and, and being kind of more consistent with my look and, and the images that I was seeking out. But I also noticed that it was no longer about me. I think I became comfortable with my slight discomforts about my own sense of identity. And it was, I felt something that I was never really going to be able to really work out. My identity is shared across, you know, three different countries. And I have to just accept that, that I'm never going to be this thing that, that I was almost feeling like I could work out. So I think a country kind of silence became more about the place, but it's, it's a progression which has gone from questions about me to questions about it, you know? So it's like, I'm here now, this is where I live, this is what the closest thing I'll feel, uh, I feel will be home. Um, let's talk about it, you know, and about its sense of identity and its complex sense of identity, which it is very complex. You know, the UK is, or England, should I say, is incredibly complex in its identity. You know, the things that we associate with Englishness, like, I don't know, you know, pie and mash and, and fish and chips and a red phone box, you know, this, this is always changing, constantly changing, you know, like now you've got a fish and chip shop and it's owned by, usually by an Asian family that will also sell Chinese food, you know, um, but they'll still make you a battered sausage, you know, so, so it's a very complex kind of identity, you know, and, and it's, it's changing even more and the more different cultures kind of become intertwined with English culture, those cultures become more Com comfortable with their otherness because of the way that that they've just mixed in with with this English culture that we have. I think there are a few images in the book that I feel are, are really nice images, um, but I think 
overall, I wanted the image to be ambiguous. I didn't want, I didn't want anyone to go, oh my God, this, he's painted a beautiful kind of picture of what England is. I wanted, I wanted the images to, to sometimes be of something that, that might make you feel slightly kind of sad or depressed, but it might be bathed under really beautiful lights. But I wanted everything to always be slightly, not disconcerting, but just ambiguous. You know, like you, you, you know what you're looking at, but you might not necessarily know why you're looking at this or why the photographer has taken a shot of this. And I wanted the, the whole book to be made up of images like this. One image that I think kind of describes this ambiguity, you know, and, and this, uh, this um, slight strangeness is the image of uh, the phone box. I think it was um, maybe like six o'clock on a summer's day, something like that. So the sun, is, so the light's beginning to get really nice. You know, it's not quite super soft, but it's, it's nice. And uh, it's just a scratched up kind of the back of a, a metal old BT phone box. It's a bit scratched up, but the light is beautiful. There's a bench, I think, on the right hand side and, and then lots of kind of blue sky. What I find really interesting about this image and one that describes this ambiguity is the fact that that is the, the phone box at Beachy Head. And Beachy Head is probably the most fa famous suicide spot in the UK. So whilst, whilst you have a really beautiful image that you just go, okay, it's a phone box, it's, it's pretty, actually the backstory is slightly ugly and very tragic. You know, you can imagine all the people that may have had very uncomfortable conversations at that phone box whose, you know, whose fate is kind of unknown. You know, you don't know whether it, it, it came off well or it came off badly. So that's an extreme example, but that is the kind of ambiguity that I find kind of quite interesting. I'm always, always grateful uh, for what photography has given me. It's, it's, it's helped me make sense of who I am and what I like. Um, and it's given me a certain confidence as well to, to know that what you do is, is so linked to who you are. It, it's almost like, it, it kind of almost became my, my therapy in many ways, in, in, try to figure out, in trying to figure out who I am. Uh, it allowed me to think critically about my work and, and what it meant. It wasn't just a collection of pretty images that make no sense together. You know, I, I wanted something that, that kind of made sense together. But the beauty is that you're always working towards something that's very focused and that's very, very personal to you. And I think, and I think the growth that I've experienced from it, I think is something that I, I, you know, I will always be grateful for, no matter what, what else happens in my life, really. I hope you found that as inspiring as I did and I hope you've got some new ideas about how to use your camera as a tool to get out there and explore the world where you live and perhaps even discover more about yourself in the process. I'll leave links to Ian's work down in the description below and if you want to go along and pick up his new book called A Country Kind of Silence, I would recommend being quite quick about it. His books tend to sell out quite fast. You can get this book now from Satanta Books. I will leave a link to the book down in the description below as well. And then just a couple of quick things before I go. And the first is that we're running our second creative retreat this year in September from the 9th to the 16th. So if you would like to come along, take some headspace for yourself in the beautiful hills of Tuscany, I'll leave a link so you can book that down below. And the other exciting news is that Parable Volume 2 is at the printers as we speak. It might even be out already. So keep an eye out for that. It's a body of work that I'm really, really excited about. It's actually the Namibia work I produced years ago. I haven't really shown most of that work because I haven't found the right format to do it, but it's been great to write, to tell that story properly, and to show a lot more of the images I made on that particular trip. So that will be out in a week or two. If it's not out already, I will leave a link to the store down below. And lastly, thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this episode. If you need a new website or a domain, they're a fantastic option. I've used them myself for over a decade now as my website of choice. One of the things I love about Squarespace is their e-commerce functionality. Because when I first set up my store on my website, I was honestly quite intimidated. How would money work? 
Would I be able to make sure that everyone gets their orders right and collect all the addresses that things need to be sent out to? But posting those products couldn't have been simple. It was just dragging in a few images and writing a description, setting the price. And then as the orders came in, I could see all the addresses, where everything needed to go to. And then once they get sent out, I could automatically have emails going, letting people know that their parcel had already been shipped. And then in the back end, there's a whole set of analytics so you can look at your sales reports. It couldn't have been simpler. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and go to squarespace.com forward slash Sean Tucker to get 10% off your first purchase. Thank you.